welcome you to Grace Street Church today. We thank you for being with us as we do our Church at Home series during this crisis. And uh, we're going to bring you a message of hope in the midst of a crisis. My name is Pastor Mark, and along with Pastor Terry and Pastor Josh and the rest of our church family, we welcome you and we are blessed by your presence today. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious Lord, you are the God that hears our prayers, and you have said that you will be present whenever two or three gather in your name. We welcome your presence and your grace in our lives. We ask that you manifest your glory today and shine your light on us. Lord of heaven, we thank you for the blessings of life and health. Thank you for allowing us to have the opportunity to be in your presence again here today, another day of life. We confess today that we are sinners and we are in need of your grace and mercy. And we pray that by the power and the blood and the love of Jesus, that we can be redeemed and forgiven. We come together in the unity of our faith today and we ask you to open our ears to hear your word our eyes to behold your glory, and our hearts to accept your truth. We pray as we continue today's church service that we will feel your presence among us. We pray for all of those here and those who could not make it with us here today, that they would be blessed, that they would come to know your presence in their lives each and every day, and that we may always serve you and grow in you as we go through the journey of our life. And at the end of today, let us go out into the world to glorify your name and to live in your presence. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, on this Palm Sunday, we are talking about the glorious triumphant entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem at the beginning of Holy Week. And I kind of took this on as a different perspective this time because I think we, we hear the same story year after year after year. And I think it needs to be told a little bit differently once in a while to bring out that special meaning in our hearts and to have God talk to us through that type of message. So this may not be your common message that you normally hear on a Palm Sunday. But I have a question for you. Have you ever had a friend that all of a sudden turned on you and threw you under a bus, so to speak? How did that make you feel? Now, I prefer to call those people acquaintances, not really friends. And I found that you go through life and you have a lot of acquaintances and very few true friends. And that being said, a true friend is one that stays by your side no matter what. And I want, to think, I want to have you today think about those concepts as we progress through the message today. So I'd like to start out with our scripture today in John 12, 12 through 16. The next day a great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples didn't understand this, and only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, and these things had been done to him. So this was the Messiah, the one who would defeat the Romans and end their tyranny, the one who would rebuild the temple and restore Jerusalem to its rightful place. They had waited for him for hundreds of years, and he was coming to fulfill the prophecies of their ancestors. And this sets the stage for the week ahead. Look at the fanfare. Listen to the accolades. Hear the 
blessings being shouted. These are truly friends who wish the best for him, right? So by their actions, you'd be led to believe that these are people who are ready to change their lives and follow his lead and become disciples of Christ. But you see, appearances and reality can be two different things entirely. So we have a problem. It's one of mistaken identity. See, on the previous day to Jesus coming into Jerusalem, Pontius Pilate had his own procession, and one that had been intended to show the military might of the Romans and to undergird the fear and intimidation of the whole of the Jewish community. The Romans wanted to quell any chance of an uprising when the community gathered for the Passover festival celebration. So Pilate's was a procession of force and dominance. And it was exactly the opposite for Jesus as he entered into the city riding on a lowly, borrowed donkey. No show of force or dominance. But still, it was a show of leadership. Authors Martin Linsky and Ron Heifetz define leadership in this way. Leadership is about disappointing your own people at a rate they can absorb. And I know that seems like a very cynical definition, but sometimes you know it's really true. I've witnessed that several times throughout my career and throughout my life. So here's where Jesus runs into a problem. His followers and others get caught up into his entry in Jerusalem, and they think they are choosing to follow Jesus, the Messiah that would save them from the Roman tyranny and release them once again from the bondage of their oppressors. But by the end of the week, Jesus will have disappointed them at a rate faster than they can stand. They will turn on him, even the closest to Jesus, the 12 disciples, will either betray him outright, abandon him in confusion and fear. But see, in reality, Jesus was there to save them from that bondage of sin and death. Something much larger and far more important than just the Romans. So how many times in life have we made the mistake of prejudging someone or something? We base our actions on foregone conclusions instead of stepping back and looking for the truth or a sign that things may not be exactly as they seem. But see, people are short-sighted. They tend to look only at their surroundings for those things that are nearest to them that stand out immediately as being the most pressing or acute instead of looking for that bigger picture. So let's look at this situation. Jesus did not come into the city in a show of force, threatening to force the Romans out of Jerusalem, or whipping up the people to overthrow the Romans and force the Romans out of Jerusalem. That should have been a sign to those present that at this time, this was a peaceful entrance into the city. And that there was a different purpose, there was a different message that he was conveying as he came in to greet them. But see, their minds were so focused on the Messiah that would set them free from the Romans that they missed the bigger picture. They missed the point of Jesus coming into the city at that time. And I think... As we as Christians, we must temper our thoughts and our actions to always recognize what is truly important in life. Not be focused on what seems to be immediate or acute that surrounds us at that point in time. But let's look at the bigger picture. Where is God? And what does he want us to do? 
But even that, we, as we look at society today, the majority of people are only looking for that instant satisfaction, that instant gratification. Or they look for the easiest way out of whatever situation they're in. And the problem with that is they fail to look at what the consequences of their actions may have in the future. And so we have to understand that not much has changed in the last 2,000 years. So the stake is set for the week ahead. In preparing for the message today, I found some interesting facts that I'd like to share with you today. Uh, the final week of Christ's life is captured for us in the New Testament across 28 chapters out of a total of 89 chapters that make up the four Gospels. So just for perspective, out of the 89 total chapters, Christ's entire life of his ministry, that entire 42 months or 168 weeks that he had his ministry here on earth is covered in 61 of those 89 chapters. And Christ's final week fills another 28 chapters by itself. That's incredible if you stop to think about it. His final week covers 28 chapters by itself. So needless to say, we know much more about Christ's final week than any other week in the Bible. The Palm Sunday event triggers the countdown to the greatest week of Earth's history since creation. So on Palm Sunday, as we call it nowadays, Jesus entered Jerusalem exactly at the time the Passover lambs were being chosen. The underlying message being that he was the Lamb of God that was coming to be sacrificed. He proclaimed himself as the promised Messiah by riding on the donkey exactly as it's written in Zechariah 9, 9. And hear the words of Zechariah about the promise coming of the king. Say to the daughter of Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. But see, there's much more to this message than just the description of Jesus riding on a donkey. The prophet Zechariah is speaking to the nation of Judah. In this passage, the prophet is reassuring the people of Judah, called Judea in the New Testament, that God has not forgotten them, nor abandoned them. So he goes on, and he writes, But I will defend my house against marauding forces. Never again will an oppressor overrun my people. For now I am keeping Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. And his rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In these words, Jesus, when quoting the prophet Zechariah, reminded those who heard him of the entire message. The message they heard was, God will deliver the nation from their oppressor, in this case, Rome. But the king they seek will come to them humbly, not on a steed of war, and on a lowly, slow-moving donkey. The symbol of a king who comes in peace, according to Zechariah. Now this story is told across the four Gospels, and as I had illustrated in an earlier message here a few weeks ago, it was done by four different writers and from four different perspectives. And so it continues on like this in this instance as well. The four Gospels record the events surrounding Palm Sunday in the book of Matthew, chapters 21, 1 through 16, 
in Mark 11, 1 through 19, in Luke 19, 28 through 48, and in John 12, 1 through 19. So each one of us tells the story of the procession, but they illustrate differences in perspectives. And I want you to listen close to this and remember what we started off with here, and I want you to put it in that correct context. So when Luke, it says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples. They feared Jesus would stir up the crowd against them, but Jesus continues. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, even the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but it now is hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. As we go on into Matthew, Matthew adds this, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, Well, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. They recognized Jesus from his previous works, but still missed who he was and what he was there to do. And Mark observes this. Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple courts. He looked around at everything. But since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. So the next day he would come to the temple and clear that same marketplace. The temple was supposed to be a place of true worship. A sacred place. The dwelling place of God. But the Pharisees and high priests had set up a marketplace to make money off the people by selling animals and birds for sacrifice. They had corrupted the house of So when we look at this, we see the difference in several different perspectives. See, the Pharisees and the chiefs, priests and prophets that were there, they were driven by greed and avarice. And this threatened those priests and teachers of the law, and they began to plot to kill Jesus. So after we hear these four different perspectives, each one tells a different story. And it leads us to different conclusions of who is there and why he was there. And so you may be asking yourself, why do we have such different descriptions of the disciples from the same event? And it's not like it is any different from the crowd that's gathered there at that point in time. Some were there expecting a Messiah to save them from the Romans and the Roman tyranny. Others were there to see the Savior who raised Lazarus from the dead. The Pharisees were there to make sure he didn't interfere with their dealings in the temple. And who as leaders of the Jewish community did not recognize Jesus for who he was and what he was about to do. Cases of mistaken identity. So as we begin to wind down our Lenten season, We've had time to look at our lives. We've had time to reflect on where we've been and what we've done. And assess where we are as Christians. So it's time to ask ourselves, which group do we belong to? Do we see Jesus for the Son of God? Do we see following Jesus as a threat to our way of life, an inconvenient truth? Do we see a Savior that will bring us eternal life? The time has come for us to make a stand for our faith as we head through Holy Week and into the transfiguration of Christ. We need to commit to being the hands and feet of Christ in our lives. Lord, 
Lord Jesus, find us, your church, gathered here today. Though we are worshiping separately, we come together in your name and into your presence. Show us your ways. Lead us through the streets this week. Show us the fullness of your love and your blessing. Help us in the day to come to focus on what matters most. Help us to see beyond the crowds and to look to you. Help us to find ways to block out the sound of the crowd and the busyness of life. Help us to listen to you when others put words into your mouth. Help us to offer our hearts when others offer their clothes. Help me to find a place to be where you need Lord, we call upon you to bring a mighty healing to our land and to our peoples. And we claim this as a victory in your name, that no power or disease can overcome what you have ordained in our future. Thank you, Lord Jesus. In your precious name we pray today. Amen. Thank you for being with us here today. We welcome you to Grace Street Church, and we look forward to gathering together. Once this path.